Welcome to the Education of a Financial Planner, where we look at the major concepts in financial planning through the lens of two quant investors who are learning the ropes of the planning process and how to help clients achieve their long-term goals. Learn along with us as experienced financial planner Matt Ziegler helps us understand the most important financial planning concepts that impact all of us and how we can apply them to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. In each episode, we will work through one major financial planning concept from the ground up and learn how we can apply it in the real world. From retirement to college savings to taxes to estate planning, we will cover a wide range of topics that apply to each of our everyday lives. We hope you will join us in our learning journey. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at the Lydia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. So we've officially determined that in the uh, prep for this that we're very happy to have Ben back uh, joining us today because this is going to be... Uh, you know, potentially a complex topic to talk about. It seems like something that should be kind of very straightforward on the surface, but it's really not when you dig into the details. And we're going to discuss inherited uh, IRAs today. And the reason I sort of thought of this, we have some clients that have inherited IRAs, and I know Matt and Ben do too, but I was just kind of thinking about the assets in retirement accounts in the US and how, you know, there's going to be, I think, a sort of tidal wave of inherited IRAs coming down the pipe as baby boomers get older and as people pass away and as children or grandchildren or other people, uh, you know, inherit the assets that are left over in these RIAs or 401k accounts. And so I thought that uh, along with the fact that there are some changes that the IRS has um, introduced here to inherited IRAs that make it a little bit more complex. Um, those were part of the SECURE Act, and we'll sort of talk about what those are. But before we get into any of that, just and we'll we'll emphasize this throughout, it's important to, you know, reference things that are like on the IRS's website, talk to your financial professional, because we're certainly not going to cover all of the intricacies and details today. This is supposed to be sort of a high-level discussion of what inherited IRAs are what you should be thinking about, some of the rule changes, and some of the differentiations between spouses and non-spouses when thinking about these types of retirement accounts. So um, to start, maybe I'll just kind of talk through, and you guys can comment on this. There's really three different things, three different levers that are going to impact an RMD, which is a required minimum distribution, or how assets get distributed from an, from an inherited IRA to an individual. And that's going to be the timing of the death, whether it was before or after the rules implemented in the SECURE Act. It's going to be the relationship to the beneficiary. So is it a spouse or non-spouse? Because they're treated very differently. And then the other intricacy and complexity here is whether or not the individual who initially had the IRA account that died had started taking RMDs prior to death or if they hadn't started taking RMDs and they passed away and the full IRA was intact. So those are the three different levers that you know determine what the amount and what the time frame is on distributing these RMDs. Um, maybe I'll just pause there and see if we have any comments from you guys or how you want to um, sort of tackle it. First comment: RMDs are really tricky. The language on the IRS page is really tricky. It's really confusing. Don't feel dumb if you have this thrown in your lap all of a sudden one day and you look it up and you go, I don't understand what they're talking about. This is a really confusing thing. And it's something where working with a professional to navigate it is not only hugely important, but hugely beneficial because just translating, especially with all the rule changes is really important. The other aspect and the reality of this is Inherited RMDs specifically are one of these quirks where a lot of people have their own anecdotal stories about this stuff right now. The situations, there's a lot of scenarios, and we're going to talk through some of these scenarios. So just because your, your aunt has her story of what she went through, there might be a totally different set of rules that apply to whatever you're going through. So knowing that these this diversity of scenarios exists, knowing that it's confusing, definitely get help. 
Now at the top of this and what you said, spot on, you should have a plan and you should work with a planner to figure out if you haven't, if you have retirement accounts, individual retirement accounts, 401ks, a pension, a SEF, whatever. If you have retirement accounts, you have beneficiaries. If that beneficiary is your spouse, you should know what happens. If that beneficiary is anyone but your spouse, there's rules. So if you're the account owner, you should know what's going to happen to the people that you're naming. If uh, you are the spouse of someone, you want to know that too. And if you're the beneficiary of one, it's also really helpful to understand your relationship to that person and how it affects you if you're the beneficiary receiving one. So if I missed one of those points along the lines, uh, correct me, catch me back up, Justin, but it's, these are really confusing. You've got the owner of the IRA, the beneficiary, if they're a spouse, and then all the other types, and then separate rules that hit every single one of these scenarios that can unfold out of those relationships. And to, to Matt's point, we were talking before the podcast and we, we were kind of talking about this and I was demonstrating my complete lack of knowledge around this. And Justin was like, you're a CFP. Like you should know this stuff. And like the reality is when I studied for the CFP exam and learned all this stuff, I mean, it's really complex. Like, and if you're not doing it on a day-to-day -day basis, like even I have to go back and like reference this stuff. It's, it, it's very, very tricky. RMDs are tough. We had a massive rule change in the middle of the pandemic that started to rule out extending the age. And then we've updated some of the terms with the SECURE Act. So we're still in this window of in the last five or so years, we've had a bunch of sweeping rule changes right in the middle of having everyone's RMDs suspended during COVID. So a lot of people, if you're not in this industry doing this all the time, you're probably not current on the rules. And even if you are current on the rules, there's a lot of scenarios that you have to play out. Don't try it at home. It's it's just, it's complicated. And so let's just try to walk through some simple examples here of how these RMDs might um, play out here. And the first, I guess, category is the account owner, the holder of the IRA dies before 2020. So they are not subject to the new SECURE Act distribution rules. And the first category is the spousal beneficiary option. So as a spouse, let's say my grandmother died in 2018, which she died before that, but let's just use that as an example. Um, she she wasn't married, but if she was, and, and my grandfather was to take or inherit that uh, retirement account, he could choose to take those distributions based on his life expectancy table which is something that the IRS puts out there. So he could use his life expectancy and take those RMDs over time, or he could follow the five-year rule, which would basically deplete the account over five years, or he could um, roll that account over into the IRA. Now, one thing I didn't say that's very important, that assumes that, um, the, uh, that, assumes that my grandmother hadn't started taking the RMDs before her death. Because if she had, then there would have been another um, option, which would be that he could take the distributions based on his own life expectancy table and the five-year the, the five year rule wouldn't be available. So right there, we're already talking, look at how, how complex that is. We're talking about before 2020, spousal beneficiary options. You know, you got to take into consideration whether or not she was taking her RMDs, whether or not she was. And then there's all those sort of subcategories below. So hopefully that was, I guess, somewhat understandable. In that it was massively confusing. And this is why the disclaimer of this whole thing is th this is really tricky. There's your music reference that I didn't prepare for today. The run DMC of inherited RMDs is it's tricky. So top level spouses below required, required minimum distribution age, like one key thing to know right off the top. If you're married and if you're below, I'm just going to blanket say 70 right now, and you haven't touched your retirement accounts, then odds are you can take that full balance and you could roll it over. If it's If grandma dies, grandpa can roll it over into his name and continue like it was his uh, retirement account all along. That's that's the cleanest, easiest scenario. As soon as grandma is into her 70s and is starting to take required minimum distributions, depending on the current, so let's just say she's like 73-ish, would be the 2023 age. As soon as she starts taking those RMDs, some of those rules start to change. And Ben, do you want to just navigate, I guess, the spousal pieces real quick and the details around this? So for 
that to, to keep up with that scenario, you would then be taking distributions based on their own life expectancy. And that five-year rule that Justin had mentioned before kind of goes out the window. I will caveat this saying, before we started recording, Jack said pre-2020 was less complex than after 2020. As you can already see, it's actually equally as complex as after 2020. So spousal makes it pretty easy. Your two options are you're either going to roll it over into your own account in your own IRA and proceed like it was yours, or you're going to keep it in an inherited IRA, the required beginning date or RBD had already passed, AKA you're already having to take RMDs. If that's the case, you're going to use the life expectancy table on the IRS's website and you're going to proceed on taking distributions from there. So is it fair to say that a, a spouse is the only person who could ever take an IRA and transfer it into their own IRA? Is there anyone else that could do that? Or is it both pre and post 2020? Are they the only person that could do that? That's the only person that could put it in their own IRA. There is something for a non-spousal beneficiary. So let's use Justin's example. Grandma passes away and passes her assets to Justin. Okay, so that's a non-spousal. He is a he would open in a pre twenty twenty era a beneficiary IRA. Now let's say Grandma left the IRA four different beneficiaries. Justin with one of four, he gets twenty five percent. Each one of the four would have to open their separate beneficiary IRAs. So it will not be just in Justin's IRA. It will now be in what's called a beneficiary IRA. That did go away in the post-2020 era, the beneficiary IRA option. In, in, in that instance, under the beneficiary IRA, do, the, do, do those beneficiaries still have to follow the life expectancy RMD? So pre-2020, if you're the kid, and I'll, I'll give a, a scenario. I had a client who was years ago, already into like his 60s. And he had an uncle who had no kids and he had named his brother's kids. There was three of them as the beneficiaries. So when this person passes away in probably the early 2000s, maybe late 90s, these three young adults inherit a an IRA from their uncle who had no children. So non-spousal beneficiary IRAs. Another just weird quirk on this nomenclature at most custodians is whatever the person's name is deceased for the benefit of then the beneficiary who takes this over. So it always looks funny on a statement too. And depending on your attachment to the person, you have to see their name on the statement. It's a little weird, but it's just a formality. So the, the prior rules was as a non spousal, uh, IRA owner, what would happen is you then transferred the RMDs would start right away, but it would be on your life expectancy. So the amazing thing was their life expectancy being fairly long, they were probably in their maybe 40s, 50s at the time, was they had to take out, say, like 4 or 5% a year based on the IRS calculation and with market returns and everything that they were. What was amazing was they each inherited several hundred thousand dollars. And even with the RMDs, this was called a stretch IRA, they were still taking, they were still getting a little stipend, if you will, of required minimum distribution out of these accounts as non spousal beneficiaries, you know, decades into the future. And those old rules, and part of why they wanted to change it is theoretically that that money getting dribbled out over time was just a little bit of money coming back to the IRS. And so the idea of now consolidating it in the new rules are basically people can't stretch this for their entire lifetime and have a whole new lifetime of income that maybe doesn't eat up the assets. And now we have this other ballooning asset inside this IRA that's been stretched out over multiple generations before anybody has to pay for it. Right. So you could stretch on top of stretch in the previous era or the previous rules which the IRS didn't love because now you're delaying taxes potentially centuries into the future. Whereas today, obviously we'll dive into how they're fast tracking some of that as, as Justin takes us along. Yeah, let yeah, me just so point, point out what he just said on that. So like, think about it. If uncle in this scenario lived till he was say 80 and he had no kids. So he probably had like millions upon millions of dollars at his IRA. So he defers taxes his entire working life, or since ERISA in this case, but he defers taxes all these years, doesn't pay the IRS. Then he passes away, takes a little bit out for his RMDs, passes it on to his 
his uh, brother's kids. Now they're just taking out the RMDs. We could have a 50 or 100 or a longer year window. We have an account balance just kicking something out and only a little piece of it's being taxed every single year while it's getting the benefits of tax deferred growth. This was a big thing for them to look at, especially with ballooning IRS bal IRA balances in the country and say, hey, that's a lot of tax revenue we're not getting a piece of. That was good. We got to that kind of organically through those examples. So I think that that's, uh, that's nice. Now let's kind of transition to the post 2020 period with these new Secure Act uh, rules and regulations. So I'll kick this over to Ben and Jack to try to work through. Um, you guys can start with maybe just the spousal beneficiary options as you understand them. So a as a, as a spouse, this is when we, in, in pre 2020 had the verbiage of eligible death beneficiary and non-eligible death beneficiary. As a spouse in the post-2020 um, timeframe, you are an eligible death beneficiary. So that gives you a, a, a couple different options. You can keep it as an inherited IRA. You can roll it over into your own account still and stretch it out over your lifetime. The spouses have the widest range of options. I will caveat that sentence with, as long as the spouse is the only beneficiary. Things get very complex. We won't cover it here. But if the spouse is 50% beneficiary and maybe a brother or sister or a child is, a, is another beneficiary, things can get more complicated and maybe those options don't exist. There's keeping that Matt just said about the stretch IRA. That is typically, even in the pre-2020 era, it was almost re always recommended. You inherit an IRA, use the stretch rules and move on. That somewhat is still going to be the case for spouses, especially if the decedent is older than the beneficiary because you want to use a younger age on the life expectancy table. So if your spouse was 70 when they passed away, you inherit the money at 62. That gives you an eight-year buffer before you actually catch up to their age on the life expectancy table, which is just a divisor of that total account balance. Really what the IRS is doing is just saying, based on the account balance at the end of the year, you need to withdraw X dollars, you know, divided by 25.2. That needs to come out of the account by the next December 31st of the following year. Do you see, like, in practice, I mean, do most spouses tend to roll it into their own IRA? I mean, how do you, how do you see this work out like in the real world? In practice, almost unilaterally. And I would just caveat the other thing that people sometimes get caught on is, especially in like second marriages and stuff like that, this is why the beneficiary reviews are so important. And this is where stuff also gets quirky if people name trusts as beneficiaries or charities or other stuff too. But generally speaking, spouses are going to inherit it from the other and just take it over. They're going to roll it into theirs and treat it as theirs because going forward, they're likely taking required minimum distributions and they're filing a new single tax return. It's the cleanest, easiest, most effective way to do it 99.9% .9 of the times, I would say. So how about non-spouses? So in the post-2020 rules, what is the general overview of how things work with non-spouses? So as I mentioned before, you have eligible designated beneficiaries and then not. So let's just cover quick at a high level your eligible death beneficiaries are spouse or minor children, disabled, chronically ill, or an individual who is not more than 10 years younger than you. So some of that gets confusing, but those are the categories that would designate you a eligible death beneficiary. Can, can I just ask a question right there? So yeah. under before this was put in place, you could name anyone a beneficiary. Correct. I mean, I could, I could have on my RA, I, I could have Jack as a beneficiary. So now, if I'm if I'm reading this correctly, they're basically limiting your eligible beneficiary options to your spouse, um, I guess your children, somebody that's chronically disabled. It's not disabled. who you can name. It's who it's who apply, different rules apply to. You can name anyone you want. Okay. Yeah. It's a matter of the different rules apply to certain people. Like the eligible means like different rules apply to them. Versus oh, I see. Okay. You can't okay. Do it. Gotcha. So I'm, I'm with you now. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, let's, let's actually use that example because Jack is 
I'm, I'm just guessing on ages here, is not younger than 10 years. Or he's not 10 years different from Sometimes your age. he thinks he is. Right. <laughs> right. Jack is the trophy wife of Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would mean he is an eligible death beneficiary based on the IRS's code here. Mm-hmm. So with an eligible death beneficiary, they can, it grants you the option to take distributions over the longer of their own life expectancy or the owner's remaining life expectancy. Or the last option is follow the 10 year rule, which means the year following, you know, your death, Justin, in this scenario, Jack would have 10 years to withdraw that money, but because he's an eligible death beneficiary, he has more options. So if you choose somebody, let's use your grandma again, Justin, as an example, your grandma leaves her IRA, she passes away post 2020, and it's 100% to you. You are a non-eligible death beneficiary. You don't actually fit any of those criteria that we just highlighted. So because of that, you only have one option. It is the 10-year rule. That means 100% of the account balance needs to be withdrawn after the 10th year following her death. So really that means to make this confusing, you have 11 years or 10 and a half years. Because why would we want to make that easy for you? We wouldn't. So that means not to get too far into the planning of this, there's a huge planning opportunity around this 10 years. Justin, let's say it's a million dollars you need to withdraw over the next 10 years. Well, you probably don't want to wait until that 10th year with market growth. That could be $2 million or $2.3 million to withdraw it all at once. There's a lot of planning that we're going to try to discuss on, on the back half of this fall that really can help set you up for success and, and cut down on taxes where necessary. So you can just to clarify, you can take the money within the 10 years, however you want. Um, you can take it equally. You can take it all at the end. You can take it at the beginning. You can do whatever you want with that, right? Correct. And and that's where each, Matt said this at the beginning, which is so critical. I'm going to go back to it. Just because your aunt lived out a situation doesn't mean you should follow that same guideline. You know, maybe your, your compensation oscillates. During a low income year, that might be an opportunity for you to pull some of this inherited IRA into your brokerage account, pay taxes, balance out your income for that year and try to keep a tax bill that's more balanced rather than, you know, you waiting to till a future date, your income is high and now you're paying, you know, a 30 or a 40% tax bill on the distribution of the IRA. See, that's the thing that th- really gets me is like the IRA, you know, they're forcing you to take for these, for the uh, n- non-designated uh and beneficiaries, you know, they're forcing you to take it over 10 years. But what that also does from a planning perspective, it pro- provides a person that's taking it like all this optionality. Like I'm just thinking of myself, like in the past 15 years, I've bought a house, I paid down some debt, I've did some renovations, I've tried to save for my kids 529. Um, there probably was times that maybe I would have wanted to take a nicer vacation than I took where I had to skimp a little bit, which maybe that's not necessarily planning as doing really what you want to do with your money. But, you know, I don't know. It seems like that to your point, Ben, there's like going to be so many different planning opportunities. And especially when these IRAs are big for, you know, very wealthy people where the money's flowing down and these are large chunks of money that could certainly put somebody in a higher tax bracket or have a lot of implications like that. Right. And and that's, the 10 year window seem, you know, you have a decade, you have 11, actually technically eight years. That's why working with a planner that you guys talked about at the beginning, is so critical because each year is different and there's unknown unknowns. You don't know if today's your last day. You don't know if you're going to be on disability tomorrow. Those, it, it sounds wrong to talk about those as opportunities, but if your income was going to go down 30%, Maybe that is an opportunity for us to pull some of that money out of the IRA. You may need it for living expenses anyway, or maybe to offset some some medical bills. But that's why year-to-year planning is critical. This is all just decision-making based on the circumstances that you're going through today. And that's why it's so critical working with a planner. That's all, you know, you're also working with your accountant and working with an attorney, coordinating all of those pieces to the puzzle together year to year is is critical in these inherited situations and pieces of the puzzle it's that 
CCBS, calendar, cash flow, balance sheet. You got all three of those things you can make a view. And then you have the context to ask these questions because I, I think Ben and I in the last couple of months, I mean, have we run like five different scenarios? And in many cases, it's like mom or dad, the last surviving parent dies. And even the two kids who inherit their 50% of this inherited non-spousal uh, IRA balance, they both have two woefully different scenarios. Even if they're affluent, well-off and whatever else, the tax planning on a 10-year basis. And then all of a sudden, so they're doing totally different things. And then one of them, it's like, oh, well, my spouse got injured at work. So now we're going to have a lowland income for a year. You got to have all the context to ask these questions. And they are so bespoke. They're so unique to your situation. And they have real tax consequences because the IRS is going to tax these distributions. And that's going to affect everything you do in your life. Yeah, that, that's the, you know, we probably should have done this at the beginning, but that's the driving factor here. I mean, basically, if I'm the person who inherits the IRA, I'm probably trying to keep the money in as long as I can because I don't want to pay tax. If I'm the government, I want money. And so effectively, that, that's the push and pull that's going on with like all the rule changes and everything like that is that the government is trying to get that money from you. They want the money out of there because then they're going to get their tax. I mean, that's, that's driving a lot of this, right? It's an oversimplification and we're not trying to paint the government as some mob boss who's shaking <laughs> us down for our money. But this is the whole this is the whole idea. And this is the idea behind the 10 year rule and whatever else. We get the benefit of tax deferred growth in these things. And at some point that needs to be unwound. And it's a real benefit. It's a real way we solve for the retirement problem above what social security and the safety benefits offer us in, in the United States, at least. But with the caveat that we can't just use this as a tax shielding strategy to avoid taxes forever, it's always going to be messy in the middle. But the reality of the planning is that just like everybody has different tax considerations and income considerations, when you have these assets and you got to unwind them, it's messy government wants their money. You want to minimize your taxes. The only way you're going to do that is running through these scenarios and figuring out what you need to figure out so that you don't spend the number one rule for us. Just don't spend more than you have to play by the rules, but don't spend, don't give the IRS more than you have to. Uncle Sam is a really great guy. When it's a real person, it's your real uncle. Uncle Sam, when it's the government is probably not somebody you want to give handouts to. And by the way, this isn't supposed to be a scared straight episode, but the other thing, and kind of this is to Ben's point, is uh, it's you know complicated. Planners can help you, and if you don't get it right, there are penalties. I mean, there's you know pre 2020, the penalties were 50 percent of the value of the RMD that you didn't take. The IRS is lowering these. Um, it's t basically, as I understand it, somewhere between 10 and 25 percent. They're settling in, depending on I guess what you got wrong but you know if you don't get this right then um you know there can be penalties on the back end there is an appeal process i've had clients that have missed rmds and they've gotten they've written letters to the irs but i wouldn't bank on that so you know it's good to keep up keep track of these i would even suggest you know anyone that ha has an inherited ira that has somebody that passed away prior to 2020 i mean get the get the core dates down the date of death you know, the value at the end of the year of the IRA, you know, track it yourself and your financial advisor will have all this information. But who's to say that your financial advisor is always going to be there for you or you might switch financial advisors. People do that too. So it's good just to compile the information for yourself and have it at your fingertips if you can. You pay penalties if you screw this stuff up. And the reality is you only have an inherited IRA if someone theoretically very close to you has passed away. That is not something you want to go through or you choose proactively to go through in, in most circumstances. So it is tough, but there's a window of time where decisions and things have to be done. And if not, the penalties, they're not nothing. They're expensive. So this is just one of the essential formalities and pieces of paperwork that you got to work through after, after a death. And then that gets messed up. So excellent point, Justin. So I'm not going to try to summarize this because I think there's a lot, but I think there are some resources out there that individuals can utilize. Obviously, if you use a financial advisor, that's the first person you want to go to. Um, we'll reference the IRS page that we sort of worked off as an outline here. Um, I like to use, I don't know if you guys have any preferred calculators online. I use Schwab's inherited IRA calculator. I find it pretty intuitive and easy. There's like, I don't know, maybe 12 different fields you put in um, that will for those that died pre-2020, 
to calculate the RMDs based on the life expectancy table. And then one of the other things that got me thinking about this is, and there's tons of articles out there online, but I think Kiplinger's did a pretty good job in this month's episode about talking about inherited IRAs. And they had a, a nice table in there, almost like a flow chart, but it was a table. Um, and so if you want to go to Kiplinger's website, I think they have kind of a similar article to what I saw in the magazine. So um, with that, hopefully you guys found this episode valuable. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono and follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.